अच्छा एक टॉपिक है डॉक्टर अजित आई यू में स्टार्ट इंट्रोडक्शन गुड मॉर्निंग वन एंड ऑल वी आर हियर फॉर द डे 19 ऑफ आवर 21 डेज नेशनल रेनिंग कोर्स ऑन एडवांसेस इन वेटनरी रिसर्च और सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट ऑफ हेल्थ सेक्टर एंड टुडे वी आर ऑनर्ड टू हैव विद अस डॉक्टर सुधीर अहमद एज आवर एक्सपर्ट स्पीकर आई वेलकम यू सर एंड बिफोर दिस वी सी लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस आवर एक्सपर्ट स्पीकर टू आवर पार्टिसिपेंट Dr. Sukhail Ahmed is presently working as scientist in charge of ICR Indian Grassland Fodder Research Institute, Regional Research Station, Sri Nagar. His academic qualifications include B.Sc. Agriculture from Fort Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, M.Sc. Agroforestry from Dr. Vyas Kumar University of Horticulture and Forestry, Solon, and Ph.D. Forestry from Faculty of Forestry, Fort Kashmir. His research areas. Include simple and forty pastoral system for augmenting augmenting forage resource availability, forage genetic resources, pastoral ecology and management. Sir has published more than twenty five research articles in national and international journals, and he is the recipient of ICR, JRF, and SRF fellowships and best researcher award two thousand eighteen. So today he will deliver a lecture on the topic. It's not with many plants and practices for improving life of health, prospects and challenges. So, before, so we can start with the presentation, sir. Thank you very much, madam, for your introduction. Respected uh, course director of this very important training that is uh, advances in veterinary research for sustainable development of livestock sector. Uh, I hope the training is going on very smoothly. i welcome all the participants uh, before uh, starting this uh, presentation i would like to give a brief uh, overview of what i am going to present in this uh, very important topic because uh, since the motto of this training is to uh, emphasize on various aspects of veterinary research vis a vis uh, improving uh, livestock sector because uh, as we already know you might be you might have got the idea that how much important this livestock sector is for our economy and uh, the government of india's goal of uh, doubling farmers income by 2022 uh, if we see uh, its relationship with livestock sector it's definitely going to work not only doubling but we may increase farmers income 3 to 4 fold there there may be the increase in the economy of the farmers by uh, more uh, uh, i mean 3 uh, to 4 fold increase but uh, the conditions the important challenge that this livestock sector is uh, facing uh, you might have got an idea of that also there are mainly four challenges which have been identified by the national uh, livestock policy when it was drafted in 2014 uh number one was the uh, deficiency of feed and fodder resources in our country and uh, number second is the breed improvement and number third is the health management so uh we know that there are several kinds of uh, treatments which are in vogue uh, presently in our country uh one is the allo treatment which farmers are obviously resorting to because of the effectiveness but there are some problems so far as allo treatments are concerned and we have majority of various uh, pastoral communities in our country in across the length and breadth, breadth of the country we have so many tribal communities who rear livestock especially in the in the himalayan region uh, which encompasses uh, so many states uh, almost 12 states come un under himalayan region both western and eastern himalayas and there are some tribal communities in semi arid and arid tracts and also in southern india and they don't have access to modern healthcare facilities they don't have access to allo treatments so they practice their own uh, uh, method which is based on medicinal plants which is based on their natural practices folk uh, practices that uh, term those all uh, practices come under 
what is known as ethno veterinary medicine so i am i am going to briefly describe uh, what this system is basically and uh, what is the importance of this uh, system of medicine so far as pastorals are concerned and definitely uh, what is the distribution of medicinal plants in the himalayan region uh, i am sticking to himalayan region because it will be it will be too much if 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 i involve other uh, states or other regions of india then uh, how this definition of ethno veterinary medicine came into existence what were the uh, i mean the historical perspective of ethno veterinary medicine then its relationship with uh, as i already told its relationship with pastoralism then the renewed and the renewed interest in ethno veterinary medicine and uh, what are the various threats to ethno veterinary knowledge and then i will be uh, presenting some case studies from the himalayas and uh, finally i will be concluding my talk i was uh, talking about the livestock uh, national livestock policy which was uh, drafted in 2013 you might uh, see that in the screen available with you is uh, that there are the major challenges which this our sector is facing because in india you might be knowing that although we are number 1 in milk production in the world but the major challenge is low productivity of livestock and especially in the himalayan region and the factors responsible for uh, it uh, i already told that shortage of feed and livestock health etc so it has also put a lot of emphasis on alternate system of medicine and this uh, ethno veterinary medicine is definitely one of them then uh, uh, this is a brief introduction of various agroclimatic uh, regions which are found in the himalayas we have uh, almost all the zone all the climatic regions like uh, tropical subtropical uh, subhumid and or sub uh, temperate and then finally temperate region and also high altitude cold arid region uh, which we designate as trans himalayan region uh, encompassing himachal pradesh is uh, lahul spiti and union territory of ladakh then uh, almost 12 states uh, are there in the himalayan region the major share is uh, from the uts of jammu and kashmir and ladakh which uh, uh, are uh, up to the tune of 41.65% of the total geographical of the indian himalayan region then arunachal pradesh which is uh, 15 uh, 15 uh, more than 15% and then the share of other uh, states you know that uh, among the global mountain systems uh, the himalaya is the youngest uh, mountain chain it's uh, most complex the altitude uh, is uh, very much variable it's uh, very uh, diversified i already told you that all the climatic uh, regions or agroclimatic zones of the himali of the temperate region are found in this particular uh, region and uh, it has a very discrete geographical and ecological entity and the main attribute of this is the fragility of uh, this uh, great himalayan chain it uh, ranges from it uh, covers about 2500 kilometers in length between 80 to 300 kilometers so is uh, the width of this region and uh, the altitude starts from i mean 500 meters to more than 800 meters above mean sea level there i already told you that uh, there are two we designate them into two hot spots like eastern himalayas which harbor about 8000 species of flowering plants and majority of them are medicinal plants whereas western himalaya it has lesser diversity uh, and comprises about uh, uh, 5000 species of flowering plants and majority of the flowering plants Uh, they are uh, uh, of medicine they they provide medicinal value to the pastoral communities and other communities also and uh, this uh, region has been identified as one of the mega biodiversity hotspots uh, because of the rich uh, uh, flora uh, there are uh, almost 25% species of these plants are endemic to this himalayan region which are only found in this particular region and uh, as i already told you that seven, more than 1700 species are of uh, medicinal value 
other species like uh, 279 species are have fodder value then 675 species are used as uh, food as wild edibles and if we compare it with the world and uh, india you see uh, that uh, almost 50% more than uh, almost 50% of the plants which are found in himalayan region they uh, i mean it's uh, the figure in india it is 17000 so 50% is contributed by the this particular uh, biodiversity hotspot then uh, this is the diversity of medicinal plants uh, belonging to different uh, uh, uh i mean uh, taxonomic groups and different families and different life forms like herbs shrubs trees so coming to the term of uh, ethno veterinary medicine it was in 1986 uh, a great uh, scientist uh, uh, dr mccockle dr constance mccockle first used this term in the research for us in 1986 then later on its definition was given in 1989 by mccockle and marcus mundy that means it is defined as folk beliefs knowledge skills and methods and practices pertaining to the health care of animals then uh, uh, other definitions there were some modifications then in 2005 there was a very concrete definition of this uh, particular Uh, aspect of healthcare medicine then coming to historical perspectives there were earlier there were very traditional concepts of causes of livestock diseases and their corresponding ethno remedies i mean there was one demonic theory the belief of the people was that some superhuman entities or witches or spirits of the dead or evil eye or what we known as sorcery or predation or uh, religious impurity these were uh, supposed to be the factors behind various livestock ailments and the remedy which uh, was used by the uh, people by the livestock owners was uh, offering sacrifices offering prayers exorcism using the jo peers wagera hote hain unki then the marriage of livestock cattle some bizarre uh, Uh, ethno remedies were also there uh, i would uh, like to relate one incident that uh, um, the livestock these gujjars and bakarwals in the himalayan region they come from two routes one is the peer panja one is the peer ki gali route from uh, rajouri to shopian and another one is banihal route in uh, peer ki gali route we have one uh, uh, mountain uh, zaznard that's a very uh, i mean lot of uh, rainfall used to happened there and it used to uh, the slope is very uh, i mean bahut zyada slope hai wahan pe to unko bahut zyada dikkat hoti thi yahan aane mein kashmir aane mein jammu se kashmir aane mein to us time pe wo kya karte the in order to ward off this uh, unko lagta tha ki ye barish zyada hoti hai so we should offer some sacrifices so it is still in vogue in uh, himalayan region and other parts of india so this was one theory then there was there was one again one theory that uh, the divine wrath that means the uh, anguish of the gods was held responsible for the livestock ailments and there were uh, ethno remedies were like sacrifices they used to offer special prayers or they used to change lifestyles then uh, so these were some of the theories then other uh, uh, theories then there was vector theory so at least in vector theory there was uh, Uh, i mean uh, people thought that some maybe some carriers some vectors are responsible for causing livestock ailments so accordingly uh, the ailments were devised uh, these uh, remedies were devised then so far as this uh, relationship of ethno veterinary medicine with uh, himalayan pastoralism is concerned we know that uh, this Him in the himalayan region and other parts of india there is multiple ethnic composition Uh, is a very uh, unique feature of the himalayan region there are so many pastoral communities for example in uh, uh, starting from union territory of ladakh there are so many tribal communities especially changpas you might be knowing that they they rear a very unique uh, breed of uh, 
goat, that's pashmina goat, which is the which is one of the costliest uh, fibers in the world. Then coming to uh, Jammu region, we have or Kashmir region, we have a lot. We have a lot of other pastoral communities like Gaddi Gaddis in uh, Himachal Pradesh and in Jammu also. Then uh, Gujars and Bakarwals in Rajouri area and also in Kashmir region, and uh, very uh, uh, Kashmiri hereditary shepherds, which locally are known as uh, Chopans, uh, they are also part of this uh, multiple ethnic composition. And uh, in India, if we see more than 171 of the total 573 scheduled tribes, they inhabit this Himalayan region. And the unique feature about the pastoral communities which are found in Himalayan region is that uh, one they, 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 they rear livestock, different categories of livestock. For example, Bakarwals rear uh, goats. That's why they are known as Bakarwals. Then Gujars, they rear cows and buffaloes. And also these, uh, I was talking about uh, Chang, Changpas, they rear Pashmina goat. And uh, other communities, Gaddis also rear uh, sheep. So, this pastoralism, that means the cyclical migration of these communities from one place to another place, is, it's, it's, it's a basically a subsistence pattern in which these communities make their living by domesticating large herds of animals. And uh, it's a very successful strategy to support a population with the limited resources of land. Because if we see these Changpas, they are the true nomadic community in our country. These Bakarwals also are the nomadic community. They don't own uh, this land. So they have limited access to the land. So what they do, they move from one place to another. They, that's a cyclical migration. For example, in Jammu and Kashmir, they stay in Jammu region for six months and uh, starting from October to April, then in April, May, they start ascending to high altitude pastures, that is subalpine and alpine pastures of the Himalayan region, for uh, not only for want of uh, fodder resources, but also these wild edible plants, they use them as their food, and also medicinal plants they use for curing the ailments, not only for of uh, the communities themselves, but also of uh, livestock. So, we can say that all forms of pastoralism, there are several forms like uh, nomadic, uh, semi-sedentary or sedentary, they can be considered as different methods of economic adaptations or ecological adaptations. Uh, so uh, livestock uh, industry, they provide them a major source of livelihood, uh, not only worldwide, but also to these pastoral communities. And these, they regard these uh, large herds of livestock as mobile banks for themselves. So uh, if we see, because uh, they don't have access to modern healthcare facilities, which are in vogue, uh, especially for those people who have well-established dispensaries at their doorsteps, but these pastorals, they don't have access to uh, such facilities. So they entirely depend on these ethno-veterinary uh, plants and practices. So it's, it, it, there is a need that we should document this knowledge. We should first study what medicinal plants they are using and for what particular element they are using. And there's a need uh, to standardizing those practices. And there's also a need to documenting uh, those uh, practices. So, uh, obviously, the role of ethno-veterinary medicine in livestock development, especially livestock health management, is uh, beyond dispute. So the knowledge is believed to be collectively and communally owned by the ancestors. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Sudesh, sir, and myself were associated with one of the projects which, are, which was on these pastoral communities. That was uh, an ICR-funded project. Uh, we carried out some study in the Himalayan region, in these, uh, especially Gujars and Bakarwals. So we, we came to know that, uh, especially the elderly people, uh, or the middle-aged people, they were the ones who possessed immense uh, ethno-veterinary knowledge. They had tremendous knowledge about the medicinal plants being used. 
they could identify the medicinal plants they had their own practices i will be coming to that uh, case study later on so uh, this is transferred from one generation to another generation so it there is a need to document that especially uh, taking this knowledge from the elderly people then uh, off late uh, now in the last decade also there has been a renewed interest there has been a resurgence of this ethno veterinary knowledge when this uh, advancement of this ethno veterinary knowledge came in 1986 or 80s or 90 early 90s people were apprehensive that um, uh, it may not be uh, it is based uh, they they thought that this ethno veterinary knowledge is based on myths they labeled uh, this knowledge as being primitive but uh, Uh, since uh, it was its in, in it is importance was uh, i mean i didn't it witnessed and these medicinal plants they represented one of the first pharmacological interventions attempted by local healers and uh, even today 25% of our convenient conventional drugs they are plant derived in a traditional form so and uh, there is a report that more than 80% of the world's people Uh, especially in poor and less developed countries depend on traditional medicine for their primary health care requirements so because of their holistic nature because of uh, almost uh, no side effects these traditional remedies offer efficacy uh, combined with safety more often than single conventional drugs so uh, we have to be very careful that uh, there has to be a complementary approach i mean a synergism that we should use both allo treatment in combination with uh, this uh, ethno veterinary treatment because this uh, traditional uh, medicine is easily accessible by people at all levels and sometimes not costing anything and can be obtained through uh, i mean they they have a specific trade among themselves barter trade which is very convenient for these pastoral communities and in allo treatments we know that there has been a scarce and erratic supply of veterinary drugs and supplies then high costs of veterinary drugs and uh, since these uh, livestock they don't have access to modern education also so because of their illiteracy these uh, local healers and animal owners are not in a position to uh, i mean distinguish between the various types of uh, allo medicines and understand their underlying principle of administration Uh, and action so they don't however encounter such kind of problems when they use these uh, traditional preparations so these uh, ethno veterinary practices are considered to be their best alternative so coming to the threats which these uh, which this ethno veterinary knowledge uh, faces this is uh, immense knowledge uh, they have about their natural environments about based on centuries because they have been Uh, living close to the nature from so many so from several hundred years so they possess immense knowledge about this uh, natural remedies and uh, as uh, rightly said by dr patricia cochran that when an elder dies it is just like a library burning down so he, an elderly person has immense expertise immense knowledge gain through years of experience so this is there is a need to document this uh, uh, i mean the elders experience its encounter with the with various natural calamities these uh, diseases so there is a danger that this method of uh, wasting knowledge in human custodians can be undermined by mortality therefore uh, losing important information to the future generation so we have to document we have to validate these practices and uh, medicinal plants which these are using so coming to case studies one case study is from darjeeling district of west bengal it's uh, it's a famous uh, spot in uh, region in india for its biodiversity as well as for uh, various uh, medicinal plants so one study was carried out uh, in this region and uh, this is home to some unique ethnic groups like santhals munda and orion tribes and uh, in this particular investigation uh, the researchers have come out about a survey of about 36 medicinal plants which uh, belonged to 28 families 
they were used by the traditional uh, healers of this particular region for treatment of various diseases and disorders for example this is the list of uh, some uh, medicinal plants which these uh, were used but they have not given the the uh, practices how these are being used they have just enumerated the number of plants which are being used for various ailments in livestock like uh, uh, for uh, curing digestive problems for uh, stomach aches for cough and cold for bronchitis for scabies for gastric problems for diarrhea and dysentery then cuts and burns etc or internal parasites or external parasites flatulence acidity so there are a lot of medicinal plants this i will be sharing this presentation with you so you, you can see by yourself and another study uh, is of is from sikkim himalaya it's uh, also home to several ethnic tribes like lepchas bhutias limbus and in this particular study the researchers have enumerated some 25 plants species which were used for various diseases and disor disorders in livestock and this is the li the list is given and uh, they have given the practices that means how a particular medicinal plant was used for a particular livestock element for example this elastonia scolaris it's uh, a very important tree species in the eastern himalaya so this is used for curing fever in livestock what they do they take the bark of this particular tree make a powder out of it they mix it with common salt and it is given to the livestock thrice a day so for 2 to 3 days so this was used as uh, as a as a practice for curing fever similarly uh, in uh, if you take the examples of another species that is bohinia variegata which locally is known as tucky they they use it to control to control expel placenta two cups of root uh, the, the root of this particular plant was used uh twice uh, it was given daily to the livestock similarly the practices are enumerated for other medicinal plants and uh, coming to case study third which uh, is from uh, gadwal region of uh, uttarakhand uh, this, this is also a survey type uh, uh, study where the researchers have come up with an enumeration of 35 plant species of uh, belonging to 26 families and uh, were recorded in this particular uh, region they have also come up with uh, that means which part of plant was mostly used for curing different livestock diseases so this is again a list is given and also the corresponding ethno veterinary practice is also given for example if we take the case of cannabis taiva which is regarded as a weed in uh, himalayan region so uh, the fresh they took the fresh leaves were kept in water for 1 to 2 hours and then grinded and extract the smeed is given to cattle twice a day to cure dysentery so leaves of this plant and black pepper were grinded together and uh, prepared a thick paste this paste is fed to the animal along with uh, matha in case of blood in excreta so similarly for other plant species it's also given so coming uh, to another study which i was uh, telling uh, about uh, this uh, we used this uh, this was a collaborative study dr sudesh radutra ji was the pi of this project and it was uh, aimed to identify and document the plants used by various pastoral communities in uh, jammu and kashmir the study was conducted from 2012 to 14 in the alpine pastures and uh, for these uh, especially these pastoral groups like gujars and bakrawals so we documented 32 plant species belonging to 19 families uh, that were used as a source of herbal remedies by pastorals this uh, is the list of the major pastorals which are found in the united union territory of jammu and kashmir Uh, the composition of livestock they own and the type of pastoralism they practice for example lot of uh, medicinal plants they use for the for curing livestock elements and the corresponding uh, ailment for which they are being used and how that preparation or application they are 
resorting to. Then uh, another study is almost similar. I will skip this study. And uh, this is a very important study carried out in Doda district of Jammu and Kashmir. In this study, this is this is more of a, I mean, a very torrent study. This is the way we should be we should uh, conduct research, and we should come up with a, not only the enumeration of medicinal plants, but a particular ailment has been identified. The plants have been identified for that particular uh, ailment and which part of the plant has has been used by the communities for treating that ailment and how they are using that particular uh, how that ethno veterinary practice they are using for example uh, bloating is a problem in livestock so many medicinal plants they were using like angelina glauca rumex nepalensis piper nigrum uh, solanum lycopersicum then together with some chemicals like sodium chloride and sodium bicarbonate they used for example they have given a very comprehensive uh, how this uh, practice was used for curing ailments in various categories of livestock um, 12 ailments they have categorized and 18 ailments sorry more than that and uh, another study a very important study has been that was documented in uh, kathua region of uh, jammu and kashmir and they have used a very important parameter that is ICF, uh, informant consensus factor, and you use value uh, to optimize or to quantify which particular medicinal plant or practice is most prevalent in a particular community and for a particular ailment. Then uh, coming to case study number eight which is a very important study because in the previous uh, case studies what we used some studies only enumerated the medicinal plants other species only elucidated or uh, gave us idea about how that particular practice is being followed for a particular ailment but this particular study and we should conduct more such studies this entails clinical validation and subsequent monitoring of ethno veterinary practices adopted for healing of uh, particularly three types of chronic uh, diseases in livestock. One is uh, sole crack in captive elephants, then uh, non-specific chronic superficial wounds in cattle, then yoke gall in blocks. Uh, so this is a very important study where they have done some clinical validation and uh, monitoring. For example, this is pododermatites, or uh, which is the sole crack disease in elephant. This is yoke gall in block. In the coming to yoke gall in block, for example, in the ethno veterinary practice, mustard oil was rubbed first on the yoke gall, followed by uh, the leaf latex of uh, one medicinal plant. Then the legend was thoroughly massaged. This led to inflammation of the wound that burst subsequently the next day. Then the yoke gall was pricked by a needle for aspiration of the exudates. The wound healed automatically. Injection of oxytetracycline along with phenaramine malleate into the yoke gall that continued for five days. That was the allopathic treatment which was offered to the affected animal. So there will be comparison between these two, uh, the, between ethnoveterinary practice and between the allo treatment. Now, Say, for example, these are the, this is the list of plants which is being used for wound healing in this particular study. And if we see table two, this is the clinical validation trial of treatment of, say, for example, sole crack with allopathic and ethnoveterinary practice. And the criteria which the researchers or authors used was the effectiveness, it was the quickness, side effects, ease in preparation, availability, and cost effectiveness. And if we see the perception of the farmers uh, or the clinical valid validation choice, mein, matlab, the means we, which we have got, it's almost comparable. If, uh, for example, we have to here come up with a trade-off, we have to set a compromise here. If effectiveness is more in allo treatment as compared to ethno treatment, but coming to side effects, allo treatments, we have more side effects and we have less side effects in ethno treatment. Similarly, ease in preparation is uh, very uh, high so far as uh, 
uh, ethno treatment allo treatment is concerned in this particular uh, ailment uh, then coming to cost effectiveness obviously ethno treatment is way uh, cost effective as compared to allo treatment so here for a particular ailment we have to study such type of uh, uh, comparative study or clinical validation is needed so that we can arrive at uh, using uh, both allo treatment as ethno treatment as a as a, in in tandem in complementarity and coming to non specific dermal bounds similar uh, perceptions the criteria they have used and similar perceptions in the form of means they have come up out with and in table 4 you can see the clinical uh, validation so far as effectiveness as effectiveness is concerned it was almost similar and in fact then if we see side effects there were less side effects in ethno treatment and coming to cost effectiveness ethno treatment was obviously very cost effective so coming to there are a lot of constraints in the medicinal plant sector i will not be delving more on this because uh, there has been paucity of research on this uh, sector there has been uh, i mean shortage of suitable cultivation technology uh, the production is of very small quantity there is unscientific harvesting of these medicinal plants uh, going on there is poor marketing infrastructure and poor coordination among different stakeholders so the way forward is that uh, there is a need to focus research on ethno veterinary medicine and ultimately blending with conventional veterinary practices in order to achieve sustainable animal health care in rural and peri urban communities of the world we have to strengthen traditional systems of uh, medicine uh, maybe uh, we have to train orthodox veterinarians about uh, these medicinal plants about their identification about the practices which uh, these uh, local healers or communities are practicing so but uh, the irony is that little or no research uh, is focusing on traditional veterinary medicine to understand the underlying science and promote validation procedures and processes as i already mentioned that there is a need that we should promote uh, more validation procedures and processes we have to train and equip vet ethno veterinary practitioners Uh, not only orthodox veterinarians but also ethno veterinary practitioners they need to be uh, equipped with modern veterinary techniques practices and knowledge so as to make them front line para vets to deliver in primary livestock healthcare systems at community level now a uh, one uh, very good uh, uh, trade off or a set of compromise has been given by martin Uh, he described the three circumstances leading to the selection of effective and appropriate practices for different conditions from either orthodox medicine ethno veterinary practices or the combination of both for example for acute life threatening infections and epidemics modern medicine such as antibiotics will remain the first choice and uh, coming to for common diseases and chronic conditions like colds skin diseases or worms wounds reproductive disorders nutritional deficiencies and some mild diseases where ethno veterinary medicine has much to offer and should be strongly considered as an alternative or complement to modern treatments then uh, for problems such as uh, trypanosomiasis or ticks neither modern nor ethno veterinary medicine all alone provides a satisfactory solution so a combination of modern and local remedies and management practices might be the best option we have to enhance education and multidisciplinary research programs at uh, institute level because veterinarians they don't have thorough knowledge of medicinal plants similarly plant scientists they have don't have that much knowledge so multidisciplinary approach is very much needed and it's very exhaustive and effective in not only collecting evaluating analyzing but documenting this ethno veterinary knowledge so uh, concluding uh, my presentation in ethno veterinary knowledge we should put more emphasis on documentation of the knowledge as i already told that it is dying so we have to document this knowledge secondly based on based on learning procedures and methods in uh, traditional knowledge 
we have to come up with more clinical validation trials in uh, this uh, aspect so more pharmacological clinical validation and ethno veterinary studies must be carried out to improve our understanding of traditional practices thank you very much for your kind attention if any questions are there i will be happy to answer over to you dr majid sir thank you so much sir for your wonderful uh, presentation and um, there are no questions in the chat box i request the participants if they want to ask anything they can type in the chat box or they can unmute themselves and ask them any questions from participants i think someone raised the hand i think uh, previously if they have a question they can ask directly i do think so sir there are any questions from the participants if there are any questions please ask i can hear yeah. you can use the chat box also or you can email also i will be dropping my email here so you can see and later on we can interact if you need this presentation i can also share this presentation Majid, so you can send it you can send it to me and i will make it part of the youtube video itself okay thank you very much thank you very much okay. thank you everyone yes, Okay. Let's join back for the next session. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sakir. Thank you, Ajita, ma'am. Thank you. Sir. Thank you.